Hello. Hello. Good morning. Welcome back to the second week of 5G Hack the Mall here at Aalto University. My name is Evelina and with me is Laura. And we are the community managers helping you with your questions. Um, we will be with you also this week until Friday and your final pitches. Now it is time to get back to the top-notch lectures. We have the pleasure to introduce Assistant Professor Yu Chao from Aalto University, who is going to tell you about the verticals of 5G. Actually, on 5G and also on the AR VR applications. And that's why I'm going to give a lecture today here about 5G for XR. So, what are the requirements uh, and how would the 5G fulfill these uh, requirements? So, now I will start uh, sharing my screen. Okay, great. And, and if you have any questions during the lecture, just please uh, feel free uh, to send the questions through the chat or the other channels. So I will see them and I will try to answer them uh, during the lecture or at the end of the lecture. So first of all, as I said, um, XR. So basically XR stands for extended reality. So it is an uh, umbrella term of all different kinds of uh, immersive technologies. So quite often people are confused. So I often got the question like, well, okay, what is the difference between AR, VR, and, or because sometimes we see AR, VR even, you know, work together. So that's why I think it's very important that we first know what exactly um, is the difference between these different technologies, especially virtual reality, mixed reality, and augmented reality. And then we will see that the, uh, they have also different requirements from the computing and the communication perspective. So let's start with the virtual reality. So I guess uh, many of you have probably uh, played some VR games or have at least tried some uh, VR applications. And so you can see from the uh, from this slide, I give some examples. So on the left, you can see that's like a, a basketball game in the VR mode. And on the right hand, so that's like a kind of a virtual tour. So nowadays when you are trying to buy the apartment or to rent apartment, you don't necessarily need to visit the place, but uh, it's possible that you just uh, put on a VR headset and you do a virtual tour there. And for the VR, uh, to use the VR, uh, you need to some special tools. For example, if you want to use your own phone, and you can see there is an example, so Samsung Gear VR. So you can just um, plug your uh, smartphone into some special gear like that. And then they are typically come with also one controller. Uh, but that one is, we call it like a consumer grade uh, product. So it's relatively cheap, but of course uh, the resolution and in general the, uh, the immersive uh, experience is not as good as the professional one. As we can see on the right, for example, the HTC Vive Pro I. So that's uh, a more professional uh, product. So it comes with a headset and headphones. Uh, controllers and also uh, those base stations. So we will explain what those are used for uh, later. 
So you can see here, like um, the VR basically provide you this kind of immersive uh, experience in a completely simulated environment. So in other words, you only see this virtual world, but you don't see the physical world at the same time. So that's the VR. And it is uh, especially useful for gaming, for training, and this type of uh, applications. And if we move to augmented reality, it is opposite uh, in the way that you can see the physical world. Uh, I guess some of you have played this Pokemon Go. So you, you see uh, the real world in front of you, but at the same time, there will be an overlay of this digital content, for example, the Pikachu, or it might be sometimes um, uh, some 3D model, uh, 2D picture, text, or even videos, um, which are overlaid on top of those uh, physical uh, objects. Uh, and currently, this kind of AI is becoming very popular because um, companies like uh, Google and um, Apple, so they have launched their own like AR Core, AR Kit, this kind of SDK. So it is pretty uh, easy to create some uh, AR applications. And for industrial case, for example, you can see those V6 M400 smart glasses on the slide. So those are some smart glasses which can be used uh, for AR, for example, for assembly or maintenance task. So when you put on the glasses and when you are trying to uh, operate on the machine, you can see the instructions in front of you. So that's a very uh, a, like a popular use case in the industrial AR field. Um, so, as we mentioned, that VR is basically a completed uh, virtual environment, and AR is like uh, you interact with the physical environment, you see some digital content. And then MR, which stands for mixed reality, it comes in between. So, mixed MR, you can consider it as an advanced form of AR. And uh, one good example of this kind of MR device is Microsoft HoloLens. So now actually comes the second generation, so Microsoft HoloLens 2. And uh, for this kind of MR, the difference is that you can actually interact with both the physical world and the virtual world at the same time. So basically, people have been using it, for example, for this kind of uh, uh, remote maintenance or for the um, so-called uh, uh, tele surgery. So when you put on the glasses, you see um, the machine in front of you, but you can also see, like for example, the video conferencing, you know, sessions there. You can also see maybe the 3D model of the models of the machine, and you can operate both the physical and the uh, virtual objects at the same time. So this is like um, uh, somewhere in between, uh, between the AR and the VR. Um, but from this um, picture about of the HoloLens 2, you can also see that, you have this see-through glasses, you have cameras in front and also many sensors there. And for either of these, uh, AR, VR, or MR, uh, for the users, the very important thing is to gain this kind of immersive experience. So basically, um, if you, you, you are not able to provide immersive experience, then, then it's not uh, considered as a good AR or VR or XR application. And there are three pillars of this type of experience. So basically, there are three parts that are very important. So one is the visual quality. You can simply imagine that if you put on the VR glasses, uh, and you imagine that you are now traveling, for example, or you are touring in the museum, but if the visual quality is low, you can't even see the painting on the wall, then it's definitely not good. Uh, and especially that uh, in the VR uh, world, you should be able to, uh, for example, to turn your head 316 degrees to see, you know, the, the full uh, spherical view. You are able to, um, you know, to see also uh, to, had to put your head up or down to see you okay in the vertical way and how everything looked like. And it often also comes with the sound. Um, for example, if you are trying to watch a concert in the VR mode, so then this kind of view, visual view and the sound should be synchronized and should have also high quality there. And the third one is called intuitive interaction. So this is something um, actually uh, a very, let's say, a hot research topic still. Uh, 
And so how would people interact with this XR? So typically people think, okay, we can use, for example, speech, right? Speech recognition, or you can use touch screen. So for example, for the glasses, it often come like the, uh, on the side of the glasses, then you can uh, use the touch screen and then you scroll uh, down the menu and this type of thing. Um, but now it become more and more popular to use, uh, for example, uh, gestures. So, or even the whole body. So you can use either your hand or the body. So different kind of gesture as a one way to interact uh, with this kind of applications. But when you are using either speech or the body movement, and then it's very important that when you move your body, for example, and then um, the system would be able to recognize that and immediately react. For example, when I turn my head, I sh and, and what I see should immediately, you know, uh, be switched to the, the new content. But if there is a long latency, then you can imagine that the experience is definitely not um, acceptable. So we need to minimize this kind of latency. We often call it like a motion to photon, meaning that when I move until I see what I should see, so that kind of latency should be minimized. And here we give some example here to say, uh, to explain, okay, uh, how would we fulfill th this requirement and what exactly are the requirements? So as we say, the first one is about the visual quality and in the VR mode, it's very important to provide the 360 degree video and how this kind of uh, 360 video are made. They are typically uh, captured by, for example, the uh, specialist uh, omnidirectional camera or quite often they place several cameras uh, uh, kind of at the uh, spherical array. And of course, uh, this camera, they need to have some overlap in the view, and then they uh, capture the video at the same time. So, so then you are able to create a 360 video. And this is very common, for example, uh, for live sports game or live concerts. So, so then you have several cameras there, and then the uh, audience sitting, for example, at home would be able to see everything there. And the vision of the users, as we said, that um, are able to unfold um, the view 316 degree horizontally and 118 degree vertically. And it is uh, understandable because your head, you cannot move to the back. So of course, it's just 118 degree vertically. Um, and, uh, and we say that at, at when you, what you can see, you can only see a part of this uh, spherical data, spher uh, spherical data, and we call it field of view, so FOV. And we know that for human being, typically we can see about 220 degree um, horizontally, so which is this uh, natural uh, FOV. So uh, then this is also the aim. So ideally, so any VR or AR glasses should be able to provide also 220 degree this horizontal horizontal FOV, uh, but unfortunately our our technique is not there yet. So uh, those modern uh, VR headset, for example, we have in the market. So typically the FOV is still like about uh, between uh, around 100 degrees. So only 100 or sometimes 110 degrees. So we don't have things like a 220 degree yet. Um, and I think here you can also see from the bottom, there is a picture to show what it actually is a field of view. And, and then on the top, there is a smartphone display. So this is like, for example, you put a phone into a gear and that is what is displayed on the smartphone. But at the bottom, that is what actually you see. I mean, your brain can see like this way. And the second one um, actually is about the interaction. So how do you interact with uh, uh, AR or VR or MR? So we give use uh, VR as an example. So for example, in the picture, what we see is actually the HTC Vive. It's a quite uh, this kind of professional uh, VR devices. And uh, 
comes with the VR headset itself typically has like a motion sensor, so it can detect the movement of your head uh, your, when you are moving your head horizontally or vertically. But at the same time, it comes with two controller, handheld, uh, hand, handheld uh, controllers. Um, and when you install this HTC Vive, for example, uh, you, you can install two base stations. So you can see like in the corner, two corners. So there are like a two base stations. So those are kind of like a laser emitters. So then with the controllers and the base stations, then the system would be able to detect the orientation of the user, the velocity, the angular velocity. So basically know where you are in the room and which way you are, you are so how, uh, which way you are ro rotating or you are uh, moving your body. And there is a very important term um, to remember here it's called the six degrees of freedom. So the six degrees of freedom um, is something to describe uh, the freedom of movement, of your body movement in the 3D space. And we know that our body can move um, either forward or backward, up or down, or from left to right. So that's like a three direction. But at the same time, it um, should be able to rotate uh, around any of these axes. So you can see there, so we call like row or yaw or pitch. So three different ways of rotation. So three plus three, that's six degrees of freedom. So that's ideally that we should be able to provide this kind of six DOS in the VR mode. Um, and as we just showed uh, first, it's like uh, if you have the base station and the controller, um, but then you need to use the controller. But we know that this kind of controller, it's still, uh, it works a bit like a mouse somehow, but it's still not a very natural way to interact with those, uh, either th those XR applications. So now in the market, actually, uh, there comes more and more these smart gloves. Uh, for example, here we give two uh, examples. So one is this capital glove. So you, and this is for the gesture-based interaction for, with the VR. And on the, uh, at the bottom, there is another example, it's a big box sensors. So, you, so basically it can track how your fingers are moving and then you can use different uh, hand gestures. For example, uh, you can use special gestures to mean that how you would, uh, let's say, open an app or close an app or swipe, so those are simple things. But more complex thing is like, for example, when you are trying to assemble a machine and you might be using tools like screwdrivers or hammers, but then uh, you, you can imagine there is like a virtual hammers in the, in the VR, and then you can just imagine how you do it in the real world, and then you, uh, you just hold something like that, and, and then you, you uh, or you just are holding a screwdriver and you turn it, and then the VR app, for example, they can recognize your gesture and know that, okay, now you are trying to, you know, to screw, tighten the screws, or you want to loosen it. So for these kind of gloves, so they basically, they have uh, like accelerometer and gyroscope embedded, it and, and of course, they might have other sensors as well, Some, for, for example, pressure sensors or flex sensors to better detect how your fingers are moving or how much force you use. Um, and another example is this uh, leap motion. So leap motion doesn't use this kind of uh, accelerometer or gyroscope, but they are using infra cameras to recognize the gestures. And I will give you uh, one example here. So this is actually uh, one application developed by the student in, in, in the group. And they are using actually HTC Vive uh, and also the leak motion. And you can also see from the example how they actually interact with the speech and gesture at the same time. Welcome to virtual assembly training. Uh, Take a moment to familiarize yourself with your environment and your virtual hands. To begin, load an assembly using load command. To list available assemblies, Use list command. Can you hear actually? List. Available assembly tasks are half. Load R. This is the thing you need to build. You can grab it to hand later if you need to take a closer look.
Yeah, so you can see this kind of uh, fine-grained um, interaction. So it's it's not easy if you are using something like, uh, for example, mouse uh, to do that. And in this case, actually, we are using spare hands because there is a leap motion camera which can capture how our uh, fingers move. So we just uh, do it, I mean, as we usually do in the real world. Yeah, so this is just to give an example that how the VR can be used uh, for training, for education, or for example, even for surgery. Um, but uh, the headset itself is not enough. So you would need something like um, either like smart gloves or leap motion type of uh, motion tracking modules there. Um, and later we will explain why this is also important because if you go to the 5G, if everything needs to be processed remotely, then this kind of um, sensing uh, sensor data also need to be transferred and be processed in the real time. Okay, so we will uh, skip the rest of the video because it's, it will just continue doing things like this. So, um, so after we talk about this uh, motion and the video, so that's a very important issue that we have. We, we also need to discuss because quite often when uh, people are reluctant to uh, use VR because it might cause sickness. And, and why this sickness might occur? So there are two main reasons. So the first one is that uh, uh, when the fresh rate, refresh rate of the on-screen images is not high enough, meaning that uh, your brain actually processes faster, then this will cause some kind of like a dizzy feeling. Um, and typically we expect at least 19 hertz or beyond refresh rate. Um, but you can imagine that the higher refresh rates you expect, then the more powerful uh, device or the more powerful computing capacity are uh, expected. And, and the other uh, cause is actually the low resolution. So um, currently the resolution we can see, for example, from the phone, even the phone display or from the headset, we are typically just talking about like a uh, maximum like a 4K or even lower. Um, but uh, what is actually expected is we are talking about like a per eye. So for each eye, uh, there need to be at least 2K by 2K pixels. And ideally, it should go to even 8K uh, per eye. And this is something that we cannot achieve yet. Uh, and there are, of course, uh, different uh, reasons why it can't be achieved. One is from the hardware perspective. And also, the like, for example, if you need really 8K per eye, and we can imagine that the cost of the hardware is also going to be pretty high. And also, uh, how would you handle, uh, how would you, for example, render, render the uh, VR content with so, such a high resolution? You also need a very, very powerful uh, computer there. Um, and here we give an example to explain why this is like uh, still difficult to achieve. Uh, so when we talk about the VR, we talk about the resolution, and there is also one term called the angular resolution, meaning the number of pixels per degree. And we know that when we give a given one display, if we want to see wider uh, horizontally, meaning that if we want the uh, field of view to increase, when we increase that, then it means that the angular resolution will decrease. But uh, we want both the FOV and the angular resolution to increase. For example, if we want to double the FOV from uh, 110 to 220 degrees, and we also want to increase the resolution to double it, then it means that the resolution of the display need to be at least four times higher. Um, and that that is going and and currently uh, we usually try to, let's say, keep the FOV like that and try to increase the angular resolution, but not uh, for both 
because it really required a very, very high resolution. Okay, so these are uh, basically we have now explained the basic, like what kind of video is expected, what kind of resolution, especially that's related to the rendering we are going to talk later, and also what kind of interaction uh, is expected there. And now we come to see like, okay, then how would this kind of XR be implemented in the 5G environment? So there are different type of uh, AR applications. So we give, we take this uh, XR multimedia streaming as one example. So for example, uh, you want to watch, um, uh, let's say ice hockey game uh, remotely. And what you do is that uh, you put on your headset and you sit at home. But then there are many cameras deployed uh, in the stadium and they will shoot the video and then there will be a content server somewhere. For example, in, uh, in the cloud. Um, and then those data will be, those uh, XART content will be generated there. And then they will be delivered to the UE means the terminal, like your own uh, your, 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 for example, if you are using your smartphone and the gear, then it will be delivered to, to your own smartphone there. And then those media will be rendered there. So the rendering means like uh, to generate the uh, 3D animation. So the rendering will happen on your devices. And then of course you might uh, move your hand or you might use the controller, for example, uh, to uh, try to browse through or to, for example, walk around in the view, uh, then those kind of controlled signal will be also sent to the content. So the contents to the content server. So the content server can adapt the content. Like, okay, maybe you want to see the game from a different viewpoint. So then they need to uh, send you the different content. And so there, the important thing is that those content will be send to you just like, for example, like a video streaming. But of course, uh, it has like typically, um, it requires typically much higher bandwidth because it has like a heavier content to send to you. Uh, and at the same time, your device need to be able to render those uh, XR content. So it means that your device need to be powerful enough. And quite often that's a problem with the smartphone. So the smartphone is not able to render let's say very uh, high resolution 360 uh, video in the real time with very high refresh rate there. But this is uh, uh, one example. So you can see that from a 5G perspective, at least it need to be provide very high bandwidth in able to send all those content with very low latency there. And for your device, the device need to be powerful enough to render the content. And if you say that uh, for the rendering, we just mentioned that it's so basically there would be this kind of rendering engine running uh, in the phone or in your headset and that uh, not in your headset, but in the VR in general to generate this animated 3D graphics. Uh, and uh, for interactive media like games or simulation, so the this kind of uh, frame rate need to be uh, even up to 120 frames per second. So you can calculate uh, if the resolution is high and then the frame rate is high, then the bandwidth is, is high because the bandwidth can be calculated simply as the resolution times the frame per second there. So, um, so here actually comes the other uh, challenge we said that if your device, your, uh, can your device be powerful enough to render everything because the rendering is actually very uh, computing demanding. And there are currently uh, two types of solutions. And so the first one is called uh, for VATED rendering, and the other is cloud based VR. And for the first one, uh, the idea is that uh, instead of uh, rendering everything, like 360 uh, video, 360 view, so I only rendered uh, with high resolution something you are currently looking, meaning that if you are able to track the eyes, then uh, when I'm looking, what I'm currently looking will be rendered with high resolution, but the others, the other stuff will be rendered at a significantly lower resolution. And it does not affect the user experience 
but it will significantly uh, reduce the workload of vendor. So this is um, uh, one approach to do that, um, but you can see that it would require uh, the eye tracking, uh, quite accurate eye tracking, and that's currently available in, I think, in, in most of these uh, new uh, VR headsets, they are available. And another way uh, to solve the problem is called a cloud-based VR. So the, meaning that uh, instead of rendering those VR content uh, on your device, on the local device, you can render it remotely. Um, so how does it work is that uh, you render those 3D graphics and then you encode it into the 2D video. And then this video will be delivered to your um, uh, terminals, uh, like for example, to your smartphones, just as the normal 2D video streams. Um, and then your device just need to decode the video and play it. So this kind of uh, heavy rendering will be done remotely um, in the cloud, for example. So this is now uh, uh, actually quite, uh, it's a quite common use case in the 5G because uh, we know that the devices like HTC Vive, for example, they still need to be connected to the local computer. So they cannot directly uh, connect, for example, to the cloud um, because they typically support only like Wi-Fi connection. But for those smartphones, if you put the smartphones with the gears, then it's, you can use the cellular network like 5G to directly download those content from the remote server. Um, and then here actually it's a table that summarizes, okay, for different uh, type of VR, like an entry level, advanced level, or ultimate level VR. So well, what is the estimate of the, let's say the bandwidth which is needed? So you can see that, uh, for example, now for those, uh, if you use the Samsung Gear, for example, that's like an entry level VR. And if you just imagine something like 13 frame per rate and the 2K, this kind of resolution, um, and this shows like uh, how how much bandwidth is expected. It's like a 100 megabit per second. So this is even uh, possible with some 4G network. So it is like definitely uh, possible with 5G. But for 5G, we of course try to expect like a better user experience. So we are targeting, for example, advanced level VR, because for the advanced level or the ultra ultimate level, you will be able to get a higher video resolution, higher uh, frame rate. Uh, and with that one, it, you can imagine that this kind of sickness will happen with, uh, uh, let's say, at least you are able to use the VR for a longer time before you get sick. Uh, so that's also why it shows like the continued experience duration will come from less than 20 minutes to up to an uh, hour here. But you can see even when we just come to the advanced level VR, so the requirement on the assist bandwidth, so we need already one uh, gigabit per second. So that's like a uh, much higher already, uh, 10 times higher. And then if you want even better experience, then we are looking for something like two to five gigabit per second. So I would say that for 5G, so uh, with some something like the advanced level VR, so that would be the, the, the target there. And, and of course, as a 5G, I think you have also seen other lectures. So because it can provide this uh, um, enhanced mobile broadband or the ultra reliable low latency communication. So this will uh, fulfill this requirement of high bandwidth and low latency there. But this is only from the communication uh, perspective, you are just sending the content to the terminal. Mm -hmm. But it does not solve all the problem, uh, meaning as you remember that, so if we are able to deliver the, the content, but if your device is not powerful and you need to render the content in the cloud, so then there is another issue because uh, the cloud is quite far away uh, from your own uh, devices. And typically the latency between the VR devices and the cloud can be 100 milliseconds long. Uh, 
But what we expect is less than 20 millisecond latency. And this 20 millisecond actually is motion to folder, meaning that when you start moving your head, for example, until you actually render and see those new graphic in front of you, that's 20 millisecond. So this kind of 100 millisecond network latency is definitely not acceptable. So how to solve the problem? So a straightforward way is to think that if the cloud is too far away, can we move it closer? Uh, so that uh, so that comes the uh, new concept or new computing paradigm called edge computing. So uh, the idea is actually pretty simple. So uh, instead of sending everything to somewhere far away, uh, can we actually deploy the computing capacity uh, in the radio access network? So there will be uh, typically one hop from your device to those uh, to those computing nodes. And we call that like edge cloud or edge computing node. And, uh, and it can, you can imagine that, for example, uh, uh, in, for example, in our university campus, so there could be uh, one or even several of these uh, edge computing nodes. So all the computing, all the rendering uh, tasks for the VR in that campus can be done there instead of on your own uh, VR devices. So that's the uh, basic idea of moving the computing cloud. So, but how much, uh, how how much time can we really save by moving this cloud? I mean, moving this computing closer. So here we give one example. So basically, uh, you can see on the right side, if you are using the core cloud. So we are expecting something typically like a hundred millisecond or even up to several second delay. But if you are moving to the edge, so we are then uh, actually expecting something around 10 milliseconds to even one millisecond network latency here. So you can see this is the network latency it can be six, 10 times uh, lower. Um, and then of course you are using, if the edge computing nodes are powerful enough, then the processing delay, I mean the rendering delay uh, can also be lower. So then, uh, with both, there's a lower network latency and reduced processing delay. We'll, we expect to achieve much lower this uh, motion to uh, photon uh, latency there. Um, but of course, I would say that um, uh, if, the, if you are expecting like a really very uh, high quality or high resolution VR, uh, then this uh, edge computing node need to be quite powerful. It need to have quite a lot of GPU. Otherwise, it's still, I mean, even the network latency is low. It still are not able to provide the uh, low enough uh, this kind of motion to photon latency. Um, and then, um, as we just explained that, uh, we try to render those content at the edge or in the cloud. Uh, instead of on the device. And, and this picture actually summarizes how, how this scenario is actually uh, implemented. So you can imagine there are XR device and XR server. So the server can be at the edge or in the remote cloud. And in between could be the 5G network. So basically what needs to be sent from the XR device is those uh, tracking of the sensor data like we just talked. Uh, it will detect your head movement or your gestures and this type of information will be sent to the remote XR server and the server will generate the uh, content there. So, and then it will render the so-called viewport rendering means that it just rendered what they think you will see. So for example, something at your back, so it will not be rendered there. And then it will be encoded and sent to your device and be uh, playback there. So this is a summary of this viewport rendering. And this uh, this is actually now coming more and more uh, important because it would also solve the problem that the VR headset, for example, is quite expensive, especially for high resolution one. It can, uh, it can go even more than 5,000 euro each. So in order to reduce actually the the cost of that one. So one way is to move those uh, computing to the network. Um, and besides VR, 
so how about like AR or the MR? So, uh, and of course you might have used many AR applications, which is let's say quite light, lightweight, meaning that everything run on the phone, you don't even need a, a internet connection. Um, but here we are talking about the emerging uh, AR or MR application, we call the cognitive AR. So meaning that um, uh, when you use the AR, you naturally open the camera. And uh, what you see uh, in the camera view, for example, what are the objects there? Are there people there? Or what are the people doing there? Or what is uh, happening you know, in, the, in, in the surroundings? So this kind of information can be extracted from this kind of uh, real-time video. Um, but to process this kind of video, uh, it required also quite a lot of computing power. And at the same time, it required very low latency. For example, uh, if I turned my camera, uh, and then it still has not, it takes, let's say, one second until you see something, then the experience is not good. So here we are also talking about the uh, latency like 100 milliseconds or lower. And I will give you one, show you one example here, like so-called cognitive AR. Uh, this is like one example of a vision-based uh, positioning and the AR nav navigation in the supermarket. So what you see here is actually uh, when you, you see an arrow there. So this is like a, some way of uh, uh, kind of the digital com overlay there. Um, but how does it actually recognize where you are? So it actually uh, sent this kind of uh, real-time video streaming to a remote server. And then the server will calculate uh, where you are, which way you are facing, and also calculate the navigation path. For example, in this case, it's looking for some banana. Um, so it shows, it guides you to the area. So the server keep uh, processing those uh, video data or some or image data, and then send you back this uh, update. So this is uh, one example. And you can imagine that other examples, for example, uh, for assisted driving, uh, you put a dash camera on your car, and then uh, the camera would capture the video and then will process that at the edge, for example, to recognize now there is, um, for example, a pedestrian trying to cross the street or there is a car coming from left. So that's like the similar applications. So as a summary, I would say that um, uh, you can see either the VR or this kind of AI applications, they both require quite a lot of processing power. So that is uh, quite a big difference. Uh, compared with other internet applications, even compared with like YouTube, for example. And they require the bandwidth. Actually, the bandwidth um, uh, in, in the VR uh, application, you see a basically like a downlink bandwidth. But for the cognitive AR, it's more like uplink bandwidth. So basically, you need to have high bandwidth in both, uh, both directions. And then the latency. So here, the latency. It's the end to end. So meaning that uh, the network latency and also the processing latency required because what the user care is just, uh, for example, when I turn my head, I need to see uh, the graphic, but user doesn't care uh, whether this latency is caused by the processing or the network. And what the uh, 5G can offer here. So in addition to the wider bandwidth or lower latency, uh, is the edge computing, so which is a very important new features in the 5G. So, and, and of course, um, uh, if we look forward to the 6G, so the edge computing, the analytic at the edge, this is still a very important feature. And also the bandwidth will, uh, will be even wider and then the latency will be even shorter. So that is what we can, uh, uh, we can look forward to in the coming 6G as well. Um, so, so basically that will be uh, all to for, for this. And I guess I have used also most of the time or even all the time. So I wonder are there uh, 
more questions from the audience. Yeah, so there is a question like um, whether the web VR is the future of AR or VR uh, in the 5G. I think it's not just web VR, also people are talking about uh, web AR and, on, and this kind of thing. So of course, in general, when we talk about the web-based or non-web-based, the biggest difference is uh, um, whether you need to install, for example, those not native or to develop those native applications there. But at least I think um, from 5G, uh, uh, from 5G perspective, uh, I would say that it will be, well, it will be of course better to move everything uh, to the cloud to support this kind of uh, web VR or web AR. But as we I just mentioned that then it means that a higher demand in the computing, edge computing and also higher demand in this uh, network bandwidth. So if both can be fulfilled, um, and also on the device side, that if this uh, web VR would be able to provide, you know, the same quality of experience, then then personally, I think that's definitely a, you know, a better solution. Okay. So is there any other question? Um, so the, about the currently the latency that uh, is already achieved for 360 video or what does the protocol use for that? So as far as I know, basically now uh, I'm not quite sure for specific for 360 degree, but in general for video uh, streaming, uh, we have been testing, for example, WebRTC uh, in the 5G network in in our campus, and I would say the. Uh, the latency, if you put, if you consider the edge computing at the same time, it is less than 20 milliseconds. So that is something uh, we have, we, we have seen in our experiments. Okay, so any other question? Thank you, Professor Yu Xiao, for the lecture. Please, if you have more questions to the assistant professor, send them to us via Clanet, and we will get back to you with answers later. Yeah. Next up, we have a break of a couple of hours. We will be back with the lecture by Eero Tiainen at 1300 hours EEST. See you soon.